Well, we now come to part four in our series on the superiority of the new covenant. Let's recap what we've covered so far. The glorious new covenant first gives life, verse 6. The old covenant condemned. It was a ministry of death. But the new covenant is ministered by the Holy Spirit and gives life. Secondly, it has a greater glory, verse 8, because Christ is the fulfillment of the old covenant. Do you remember when Jesus came across the two de dejected disciples leaving Jerusalem and traveling to the village of Emmaus after Christ's resurrection? Once Jesus opened their eyes, beginning with Moses, that's the law, and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Luke 24, verse 27. Jesus was speaking only from the Old Testament. Thirdly, the new covenant covers you with righteousness, verse 9. The old covenant is a ministry of death, verse 7, and a ministry of condemnation, verse 9. But the new covenant is a ministry of righteousness, far exceeding the old in glory. And we need to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ in order to obtain life. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For our sake God made Christ to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Fourth, this glorious covenant, new covenant, is permanent, verse 11. It doesn't fade away like it did on the face of Moses. Fifth, it brings hope, verse 12. Colossians 1, verse 27 says, To the saints God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. If you're in Christ, your hope is glory. Six, it has been fully revealed in Christ, verse 14. And seven, it is Christ-centered, verse 14. John told us in John 20, verse 31, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Well, that brings us to the eighth aspect of this glorious new covenant. It brings freedom. Verse 17, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. What freedom is Paul talking about? In John chapter 8, Jesus is speaking to some Jews who had come to believe in him. In teaching them, he said, If you abide or remain in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? You see, they had come to believe that if you were Jewish, you were saved and therefore free. But in the first century, the Jews were far from free. They were under Roman bondage. And I can tell you, this thought is very prevalent among Jews today. They have come to believe that if you are a Jew, you are automatically saved. Jesus has to correct their misunderstanding. So he says in verse 34, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Who is the everyone he's referring to? Paul tells us in Romans 3 verse 23, For there is no distinction between Jew or Greek. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So how can we be made right with God? Paul goes on, we are justified by his grace as a gift. How? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. 
John concludes in John 8 verse 36 with these words. So if the Son set you free, you will be free indeed. And how does he set us free? Well, Romans 3 verse 25 says, Whom God put forward as a propitiation, speaking about Christ, by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You are set free the moment you put your trust in Jesus Christ. And you are freed in three ways. First, you are freed from the bondage of the law. Under the old covenant, we remained in bondage to the law. The law made certain demands on us that were impossible to achieve without God's intervention. But the new covenant, wherever the spirit of the Lord is, he provides liberty. We are no longer slaves to Satan, no longer slaves to fear, no longer slaves to sin, and no longer slaves to death. The Holy Spirit sets God's people free from all that bondage. Remember, the purpose of the law was to lead us to the fact that we needed a Savior, and that Savior came in the form of God's Son. He was the fulfillment of the Old Covenant. The law just alienates you from Christ, Galatians 5 verse 4, by holding you in bondage to the law, the result of which is death and condemnation. We all need to be freed from that bondage, and the only way that freedom comes is through Christ, who came to set the captives free, Psalm 146 verse 7. Second, we are freed from the bondage to sin. The same God who gave us the old covenant, now by his grace and mercy, gives us his son in a new covenant, which the Holy Spirit reveals to us at our conversion. This liberates us from the bondage we had to sin. The problem is we are all born with and controlled by a sinful nature, Romans 7 verse 5. But through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death, Romans 8 verse 2. Paul goes on in Romans 8 verse 3, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Calvin acknowledged that although we have freedom, it's not perfect. He said, freedom has its degrees according to the measure of our faith. Paul, even though he was liberated by Christ on that Damascus road, was still a sinner, but now a redeemed sinner. He groans and longs for the perfect freedom. Listen to how he put it in Romans 7 verse 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. His conclusion is, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? The answer comes in verse 25. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. As believers, we remain sinners until we die, but we are forgiven sinners. The result comes when we put our trust in Christ. That's why Paul can say in Romans 8 verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus 
from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And then Romans 8 verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And then verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. But how can you, being released from the bondage of the law and bondage to sin, to become a slave of Christ, be free? The reason is because we have been designed to be in fellowship with our Lord. Let me use a train as an analogy. For a train to function well, it needs to remain on the tracks. Once it leaves the tracks, the result is pain, destruction, and even death. Also, the train has to obey the signals and is restricted to one way ahead. Just as with the train, there are certain laws, signals, and restrictions that need to be followed in order for us to flourish as human beings. We need to follow the Creator's handbook, His Word, the Bible. Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. The path to joy and freedom is a restricted one, a narrow gate. This will involve saying no to certain behaviors that will derail us. So first we are freed from the bondage of the law. Second, we are freed to the bondage to sin. But there is a third freedom, and that is Christ has freed us from the power of death. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 to 57, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We may fear dying, but we need not fear death itself, because Christ has overcome the power of death. So we are freed from the condemnation of the law, from the bondage to sin, and from the power of death. It's God's word that liberates us from the lustful pull of our sinful nature and keeps us on that narrow path that leads to life. So the eighth glorious part of the new covenant is that we have freedom. The ninth is that the new covenant brings transformation, verse 18. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This is speaking about Christian growth. It presents what we call the process of sanctification, this is the way a believer is being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Paul tells us in Romans 8 verse 29 that the purpose of God for saving his people is to become conformed to the image of his Son. The reason God saved you and me was to create a redeemed humanity who would be just like his Son. Imitation is the highest form of flattery 
and God wants us to be like his son. That's why the Bible says, it does not yet appear what we shall be, but when Christ shall appear, we shall be like him. That's the reason God saves us. But verse 18 says, we are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, verse 18. That's sanctification working towards glorification. Paul said, if there's only one thing to do, it would be to know Christ and him crucified. Forgetting those things that are behind, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the high calling of God. And what is the prize? Christ likeness. That's what we're going to be when we get to heaven. To know Christ, to fellowship with his sufferings, to, to be made conformable to his death, to experience the power of his resurrection, to be like Christ, was what drove Paul. And it should drive us. In verse 18, we are told that as we focus on the reality of Jesus Christ, God is revealed in Christ, demonstrating his glory. And as we study Christ and gaze on his glory, we are transformed by the Holy Spirit from one level of glory to another. In other words, the Holy Spirit is daily working in us to make us more like Christ. This is the sanctification process and the goal of every Christian life. We are all to come to the measure of the fullness of the statue of Christ, according to Ephesians 4. And in Galatians 4 verse 19, Paul said, I am in birth pains until Christ is fully formed in you. He told the Colossians that we teach every man in order that we may present every man perfect. The goal of Christian living and the goal of every teacher of the new covenant is for each one of us to draw closer to the image of Christ. And when that task is complete, then the Lord will take you home. Verse 18 also speaks about glory, which is the key theme in this passage. And what it's saying is there is an increasing of glory in the life of a believer. New covenant believers experience an ever-increasing glory. This is in contrast to Moses, who displayed what kind of glory? A fading glory, verse 7. Now, there's nothing new about the idea that God revealed his glory to his people. He did so on many occasions. He revealed his glory to Adam and Eve in the garden when they walked and talked with him in the cool of the day. He revealed his glory to the children of Israel when he appeared as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He revealed his glory to his people when he came down into the tabernacle and the glory filled it. He revealed his glory to his people when he came down at the completion of the temple and his glory was manifest. Theologians call this the Shekinah, which means presence. The presence of God is always manifests itself in light. Since God is a spirit and you cannot see a spirit, God reveals himself in blazing light. Now the most unusual manifestation of God's Shekinah occurred in Exodus 34. Moses is called up Mount Sinai to receive the law of God, and he came face to face with God's glory. When he came down the mountain, the people could not look at his face. Moses had to put a veil over his face when speaking to them, verse 13. For the first time, the glory of God was literally on the face of a man. They would, in effect, be seeing God's glory manifested in the old covenant on Moses' face. This incident showed that the Old Covenant had a glory, verse 10. It was from God and was holy, just, and good. It was the divine revelation. The Old Covenant revealed the nature of God, his will for us, and it revealed the redemptive purpose and plan of God. Paul, by the way, had been accused by the Judaizers of depreciating and downgrading the law of God, but in verse 7, he acknowledges the law came with glory. 
But the new covenant, says Paul, has a greater glory, verse 9. It has a surpassing glory, verse 10, and a permanent glory, verse 11. It's this surpassing, abounding, and permanent glory of the new covenant that is the theme of verse 18. The old covenant had a glory that was placed on people. The new covenant has a glory that is placed in people. That means that we have more in common with a transfigured Christ than we do with Moses. When Jesus was transfigured in Matthew chapter 17, he was metamorphosized, in other words, transformed, but his glory came from within. That, that's why John says in John 1 verse 14, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of God, full of grace and truth. Christ radiates an inward glory, whereas with Moses it was an external glory. But the nature of the new covenant and the reason why it is a better covenant is because the glory is placed within us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The old covenant had an external glory, but the new covenant has an internal glory. And as we behold the glory of the Lord, we are transformed from one level of glory to the next by the Holy Spirit. So this glorious new covenant first gives life, verse 6. Second, has a great, greater glory, verse 8. Third, it covers you with righteousness, verse 9. Fourth, it is permanent, verse 11. Fifth, it brings hope, verse 12. Six, it has been fully revealed in Christ, verse 14. Seven, it is Christ-centered, verse 14. Eight, it brings freedom, verse 17, and ninth, it transforms. The question is, are you being transformed from one state of glory to the next? Let us pray. Our gracious Lord, we thank you for your word and for this glorious new covenant founded in the blood of your dear Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, which we remembered this morning. We ask that your Holy Spirit would press these truths on our hearts so that we can experience the practicality of true worship and praise and thanksgiving for what you've done for us. Lord, we thank you that in Christ we have been set free. We thank you that you continue to work by bringing lost souls into your kingdom. We thank you for the blessings we have in having the full revelation of your word. We have the privilege of the full glory of Christ through your word. Thank you, Lord, that the work you begun in us, you will bring to completion. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.